Shaitan and Ayyad Raji. In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful, and may God's peace and blessings be upon His Holy Prophet Muhammad and the purified members of His household and project. So, as requested for today, we won't start the new uh, subject matter. So we'll do a quick recap on what we've covered so far. Uh, and then if there's a Q&A, great. Otherwise, we can keep it short and sweet. Um, so as we said, the last lesson was the first of a series of perhaps four lessons that have to do with the attributes of God. The last lesson uh, doesn't actually get into the manner in which the attributes of God are usually presented in the classic literature and theology. Uh, the next lesson, so the one we could have taught lecture today or next week, inshallah, that's the lesson that is usually the one that presents the classic presentation of the attributes of God. So it's as though the author created one lesson to uh, make a proper link to transition between the last proof that we presented for the existence of God and the attributes of God. So to recap quickly, we only covered two big manners in which we demonstrate the existence of God in this book. The first one that he called the simple way to demonstrate the existence of God is the argument from design or by design. So when we look at the world, we see that it has design. It could not have been done in this way except with a design. So design is something that has a finality, that has a purpose, that has a goal. It's not pure randomness. And we explained the manner in which we can construct that demonstration. And we said basically it's two big premises, one of them being the world has design, and two, that the design that we see in the world requires a designer. So if someone wants to object to that argument, we have to see where the objection is. And the reason why we said that this is the, the simplest way, the easiest way, is first of all, you don't really need any philosophical premises, uh, you don't need introductions, it's kind of a self-evident <coughs> truth that any human being should recognize. When you see something that has purpose, that has design, you would not think of anything that you know in your life, anything that has finality, anything that has purpose, you wouldn't accept it intuitively to say that this came to be without a maker, without a designer. That's the first part of it. The second part is, we also said anyone can understand this because of this, uh, n the nature of this argument. It could be made simplified and presented to a child and they would understand it. So something to keep in mind when people often ask, what's the best way for me to teach my children about the existence of God? It's this proof. And in fact, we know that it's a very valid proof because the Holy Quran concentrates a lot on it. That's why the Quran insists on the signs always, the heavens and the earth and the night and day and the creation of all sorts of creatures. And each one of them were asked to... Uh, study one aspect of it more than another, it's to force us to contemplate, to find the design, the purpose, that this could not have been without a design. The other point that we mentioned about this proof is that the strength of it, from let's say a methodological point of view, is that it not only proves the existence of God or the existence of a designer, but it also proves a number of his attributes. So we're not only saying that the world therefore requires a maker. No, that maker has to be powerful, that maker has to be wise, that maker has to be knowledgeable, and so on and so forth, in order for us to see this kind of design. So the design itself requires not only a maker, but it also presupposes some of his attributes. So the strength of that argument is that it, it does both of these. It proves the existence of God as well as a number of attributes of God that are implied, implicit in that argument. So that was a, about three lessons ago. And then two lessons ago, we went into the second argument for the existence of God, which is the argument of the necessary being. 
And in certain ways, depending on how it is presented, the closest argument to this in classic philosophical literature is called the cosmological argument. So the first one is the teleological, the teleos means finality or purpose. This one is the cosmological argument. And as we said, it has many permutations, it has many variants, but the bottom line is if we look, let's say, the classic Islamic presentation of this argument, and we even said that sometimes it's referred to as the as the uh, Sainawi, Al Burhan Sinawi, Al Sainawi, in reference to Ibn Sina, because he's the one who really put it on the map, um, and it was perfected afterwards. But basically, if we look at, if we think about any creature that could possibly exist, if we any creature that could possibly exist must fall into two categories. There are, there's no third category. The first category is that of everything we see in the world, which is the category of possible existence or contingent existence. So things that can exist and can also not exist. When we look at everything we see in the world, we can say, it could have not existed, and the world would still function in the same manner. There would be any big issues, any major issues, if that thing did not exist. Maybe there are things that rely on it for their existence, but the system of existence is not really uh, destroyed, corrupted, cannot function anymore, because that existence doesn't exist. So we could imagine any existence that we know of as non existent and there would be no issue with that. That's one way to view the contingency, when we call it contingent. So everything we see in the world, we say it can exist and it can not exist. So we call that a possible, or the accurate term, a contingent being. Another way to look at it is to say it's a conditioned being. Its existence is conditioned, is conditional upon the existence of something before it. That brings it into existence. That's another way to look at it. And this makes us wonder about this quality of contingency. When we say something is possible, what does it mean? And we said maybe one way to understand this a little bit better is to say that things that exist, if they are contingent, contingency basically means they're in limbo. It's a limbo between non-existence we can't really say of them that they don't exist, because they could exist, or they could exist in the future, they could exist potentially, if certain conditions are met. So we can't really say that they don't exist, and we can't say that they exist. So because they're potential, they're in limbo between the two. So anything that you think of that could exist and could not exist is considered a contingent being. And by its definition, by its very nature, a contingent being is a being that needs something else to take it from that state and bring it into existence. Whatever needs to be pushed from that state of limbo into existence becomes a contingent being, mumkin. And that's why this proof is often referred to as Burhan al-Imkan, possibility or contingency, Burhan al-Imkan, wal wujub, and necessity. So if everything that we could see, everything that we could think of falls in this category, then why do we have anything at all? So we need to understand it that a bit further, because it may be obvious to some and not obvious to others. For something to exist, it needs something before it. Okay, that far, good. But what about that thing that needs to exist before it? Does it exist or does it also need something before it? If everything you go back to also needs something before it in order to exist, a condition for it to exist, so it's also a contingent being, then you actually never reach a being that triggers the entire chain of existence to come into existence or an actuality. It stays potential. Even that, up to here, okay, that could be a possibility. The problem arises, however, when we actually see the world. <coughs> and we say, but there is something that exists, including myself. So something must have been outside of that entire chain to cause it to exist. 
Now that thing that is outside this chain, if you want to do the same exercise, you could. If you want to go back and say, but there's another whole chain that caused it, okay, no problem, we go to that chain. What caused that chain? At some point, we have to go to a point where we say, there must be an existent, something that exists, a being, whose existence is necessary. It cannot be contingent. It cannot be something that is in limbo between existence and non-existence that requires something outside of it to push it into existence. Because so long as you go in that chain, that's the chain of regression, infinite regression, and we said that chain is impossible. So long as you stay in that chain, you never reach something that actually causes existence to exist. And then we looked a little bit more at the nature of that kind of being. And we said that kind of being must be the cause of causes. So it doesn't fall into the same type of causality as anything else. And we parked it there, and we didn't go any further until last lesson, when we talked a little bit more about causality, the different types of causality. And we said, this type of causality is a little bit different. It, because the, the entire existence of every being rests on it, as well as all of its attributes. Or, in a more philosophical terminology, all of its perfections. Whereas if we look at the causes in the rest of the world, the causes that we're accustomed to, they don't fall in this category. There's nothing that we could think of that is a cause of the entire being of another being, as well as everything that it contains. All of its attributes, all of its perfections, all of its characteristics. So in reality, you fall into one of the other causes that we've talked about and that are classic in, in philosophy, whether you go back to Aristotle or even in Islamic philosophy, where they split it a little bit further. Well, basically they say there's a final cause, there's a material cause, there's a... Basically, they're preparatory causes. They're limited causes. They're partial causes. None of them explain everything. And that's why if I father a son, my son may have qualities, perfections, attributes that are not found in me. Because I'm not the entire cause. I'm not the real cause. And we refer to that as an existential cause or a creative cause. I'm not the creative cause. We took that and we brought it to our daily lives and we gave the example, I think, of a candle, the light in, in a room that's caused by a candle. The light only stays there so long as the flame is on. The moment the flame goes away, that light disappears. The moment I remove the container in which the water is, the moment that container changes, the moment I pour it out of it into another container, water loses that shape. So every instant that that water has that shape inside that container, every instant it's maintained by something outside of itself. And this is in opposition to the classic proof that a lot of people want to use, which is the watchmaker. The proof of the watchmaker. So the world is set in motion as though it is a watch. It requires design and intelligence <coughs> and knowledge and power, just like a watch. A lot more complex, but just like a watch. Yeah, the difference is that the watch can be set in motion and left alone, and then it works forever. So the watchmaker can go die, and the watch remains. This is what we're saying, this type of cause doesn't work that way. And so the examples we use, for instance, is when you will something into existence, even though it's just a mental existence, you have to maintain it every instant. You maintain every aspect of it. You can manipulate it, you can change it. This is your mental existence. And we said even that example is not enough, but it brings us a little bit closer and makes us realize there are very different types of causes that we're working with. And then, so this is a part of the prior lesson that continued in last lesson. The other part was we wanted to look, go a little bit deeper into the argument itself. So the argument of the necessary being, what does it really mean? So the author pulled out two, let's say, attributes or sub-attributes from that. If we want to push that argument to, to its limit, what do we get out of it? We concentrate first on the fact that this necessary being is absolutely autonomous. Cannot rely, cannot depend, cannot be limited by anything outside of itself. That's one. And the second one is, 
Everything else, it's a true cause, so everything else relies on it for its existence, and that's what we just explained. So now we go back to the first one that we haven't really talked about yet. So what do we mean when we say something is absolutely autonomous in its existence? And here's where he tried to look at it from different angles. And when we say that something ap cannot absolutely rest on anything, really what we're saying is that thing is extremely or absolutely simple in its existence. So if something is absolutely simple, it is not made up of any parts. Not only is it not made up of any parts in reality, it can also not be made into parts intellectually. You should not be able to split it into parts if you understand that it is a necessary being. Because the moment you can split it into parts, it's going to depend on those parts to exist, and therefore it's not a necessary being. <coughs> and so the example he gave in the book is a line. But the line you can cut it in two in your head, even though it's not cut in two in reality. You can split it, you can manipulate it, because it, in reality it does have parts. Even though what you're seeing is not made up of parts. The oneness of God, which we haven't talked about yet, the oneness of God does not allow that. It's not the type of oneness that can be split into two. Because it's, it's an absolute. It's like you say infinity. And people who work a lot with math or advanced math, they know that manipulating that notion is very complex. But you can't split it into two. What does it mean to split infinity into two? You, you still have infinity. The notion itself should not be dividable, divisible. The same thing applies to this necessary being. So this is perhaps the most abstract part of that uh, notion. But then we can bring it to a little bit more concrete aspects. And we say the things that have parts that we know of, obviously, they must become non-simple. In our world, they're material things. They're temporal things. There are things that have to be limited in space and time. For example, if you take something and you can say <coughs> it had a before, or I can look at it in one state and in another state and in an uh, ulterior state, basically this means that you can split it temporarily. If you can do that, you're no longer talking about something that is absolutely simple. It means it evolves, it changes, there was a before and an after, so here we start getting into the topic that he called, and we all refer to as, the negative attributes. So the negative attributes is everything we cannot attribute to God. All those things are negative attributes, because they have lacks, because they, they indicate imperfection, they indicate uh, dependence, re reliance on something else. It means it's not an absolute being. So the negative attributes are the ones we cannot attribute to God, or we can spin them positively. It depends how, how you say it. But if you say, for instance, God is not material, that's a negative attribute. The not material taken together, so if you say is immaterial, or he is abstracted, he is, let's just keep it as non-material, it's a negative attribute. Anything that is a not, anything that you cannot attribute to God. <coughs> which means that, by opposition, that which we can attribute to God is all the perfections. So this is the part that we should have talked about in the next lesson, about the attributes of God, and to go a little bit more in detail about what do we mean to touch on one of the questions we got last lesson, which was, so what can we attribute to God? What are the characteristics that we use for God? And what do they mean? So what the what do they mean part, we're not there yet. The book hasn't reached that point. But can we attribute them to God or not? He doesn't go into detail. But we said this is a big topic in Islamic theology called Tawfifiyat al-Asma. Or Tawfifiyat al-Safat. Which is the devotional character of the attributes. <coughs> can you attribute something to God if you do not have a religious proof that this was used to characterize God, to describe God? Can you base it on reason, or do you have to rely on religion to know what you are allowed to attribute to God or not? And this is, as we said, it's a big topic. 
Okay, so you have one very clearly. The Shaira will say absolutely not. It's all devotional. You can't make up attributes yourself. You don't know how to attribute things to God. God has to tell you what to attribute to Him, and you attribute it to Him. Now, if He does the same thing, you you don't make up characteristics and names and attributes to God. And you have on the other side the Mu'tazila, who say the exact opposite. They say if you reason. By reason, if you can reach a conclusion that God can be described in a certain way, we can attribute something to God, then that's enough. All we have is reason. We have nothing beyond reason. Even religion is looked at through reason. <coughs> so where is the truth in this? And what do the Shia typically say? So the Shia scholars are actually split. There is no consensus. And there are very good discussions, some have written entire treaties or books about this. Uh, generally speaking, I think the proper conclusion is that there is no actual proof that we are not allowed to attribute to God things that we can prove rationally. So the issue becomes then, so can we say so we're allowed to do it? Well, this is the issue. The issue is, what guarantees that what you're attributing to God is actually a perfection. Mm. Are you confident enough? Are you commanding and mastering enough <coughs> of these philosophical, theological notions that you will dare attribute something to God based on your reason that you're sure is not contradicted by something else about God? So we have some scholars, for instance, Sheikh Subhani and others who say as a precaution, it should be avoided. And the reality that I would add is someone would be hard-pressed to come up with an attribute that, we don't, that doesn't already exist in our scriptures somewhere. So if you think that you've come up with something that doesn't exist anywhere, it's probably that you haven't looked at the literature enough. If you do, you're probably going to be able to find some occurrences of it, or you might be mistaken. That's why I said, you know, there are people who have done extensive research, let's say, on the Joshim and Kabir that is recited in and you see that it has over 4,000 some attributes of God in there. Mm. So if you can come up with something beyond what's in there, for instance, that's one example, then, you know, good luck. That's one. And two, it, the topic is even more complex than sometimes we think because there's a whole, this is a, a big topic, but um, we have scholars, for instance, who say, for instance, if you look at a verse of the Qur'an that ends, and, and this is a big topic in the interpretation of the Qur'an, the endings of the verses that have some of the attributes of God. For instance, وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْعَلِيمُ Okay, so Al-Aziz is one attribute. Al-Alim is another attribute. And we have scholars who say the combination of Al-Aziz and Al-Alim is another attribute here. Because there are other verses who did not say Al-Aziz Al-Alim, they said Wahwa Al-Aziz al ghafur Okay, so why that combination there? Do we look at them as just parts, <coughs> or is there a greater whole because of the combination of these? Yeah. But then aren't all the attributes <coughs> essentially a combination? Like they can't be treated in isolation from them all anyway. Exactly. What I just said. Yeah. 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 When you're talking about maybe like academically or in intellectually, you can't come up with a way to describe God. But sometimes I think, uh, like I was watching the news, it was just like this old black woman. And the way she spoke to God was as if she was speaking to like, Abd you know, Abdullah, like cursing, but not at him, but in her, I guess you can call her dua with Allah. It was done very... Uh, almost. Like, she's simple, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you can tell there's serious intent there. But her language is very, uh, you like to street focus. language. Yeah, yeah, street. Yes. Okay. Between you use. Yeah. And like, but I thought to myself, she's so familiar with God, maybe in her mind, that she can speak to him in this level. Mm -hmm. In her mind, it makes sense. Of course. Like you can't imagine, a, uh, you know, whoever else saying, oh, you know what I'm trying yes. to get through. You know? yes. But with her, it seems sincere. There's no issue with that. I'm not saying it, but it's interesting, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, so yeah. It, this is 
we go she, back. Yeah, to, street language is including cuss words. Yeah. But she's not comfortable with her relationship with God and her understanding of it. Yeah. That she speaks to him like this. Yeah, and what's wrong with that? To me, I didn't see anything her wrong with it. So it becomes wrong when someone else looks from their perspective. Yeah. Yeah. If you're more knowledgeable, you're as an ac ac academically, I don't think you need to use cuss words when you're doing du'a with Allah. Of course, <laughs> and there is there is a whole etiquette of du'a. Yeah. So there are people who have spent a lot of time studying the structure of a du'a. If you read like the ad'iyah, the, the, the invocations that we find on saying Sahih al sajadiyya mm -hmm. or even in the Holy Quran, we see when certain prophets pray to God, you see that it has a structure. You don't just go and ask for something you want. It doesn't work that way. And sometimes you don't even end up asking explicitly what you want. That's part of the etiquette of the du'a. And if you want to learn, that's why we have in certain narrations that we have, they ask the imam. One person comes to the imam, he tells him, I've created a du'a. And he wants to tell the imam the, the du'a that he's created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And between us, we would say, okay, there's nothing wrong. I mean, it's from the heart and you're doing that. And the imam tells him, da'ni an du'a'i. Like, you know, don't waste my time with your, with your, what you've created. And let me teach you a du'a. Yeah. And the imam teaches him a du'a. So we're not saying that there's anything wrong, but there's probably something better. Oh, better. And sure. the better is because it has a proper etiquette. Yeah. You're probably using <coughs> terminology that is a lot more appropriate for God, for... There, that's why we say you could we could make a case we could say that you can base it on reason <coughs> but what justifies so when you listen to it you say she's cursing <laughs> there is there are issues in there with the way she's she's performing her dua that are problematic at her level we're not saying at her level it's problematic yeah but if someone were to educate her you can maybe perfect okay. that dua a so little it depends bit. on the capacity of the you, person even you know so when, you, when you read the dua Ahlul Bayt, the name even specifically Imam Sajjad, even in his du'a, sometimes he has lines, I feel because of his familiarity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's like a challenge. Like it's almost a we, subtle... We have, we like have to example, go through the bits. Like, for example, like uh, something that will, will come to mind, like uh, <coughs> like he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, to forgive him, and because you're so forgiving, there's no way you won't forgive me. Yes. For example. Yeah. Not a challenge. It's not a, I don't want to use the word challenge. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right. That's how you understand. It's almost not. It's like it, it, it's not just asking, but it's almost. But it is familiar. But yeah. it's almost. Uh, yeah, it's personal. We're very it's personal. As personal as yeah. it gets, and that's what they're trying to teach us. Make it personal. Talk to God. Have a personal relationship with God. And this is the the difference, as they say, the God of philosophy and the God of religion are not the same God. Like you're too merciful to punish me, for example. Yes. It's almost like he's adding a. As, I, as we're telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what, what to, to do, do and what not to do. That's very my challenge. That. Yes. But, but it's from comfort. Yeah. Maybe someone else would be scared to use this language. Mm. You yeah, know what I mean? and that's why they become the, 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 the example to yeah. follow. Yeah. That they're basically telling us where's, where's the sandbox. Where yeah, you would, I don't want to draw those lines, but if I'm a suggest yes. doing it, I can trust the example. Tell us what to do. There is no one opinion about uh, the attributes of God or like that. If you can even attribute anything to Him, so my uh, question is: uh, Is that on a certain level? Because, for example, like we said, uh, if something is unnecessary existence, and even your intellect cannot split it in order to give it to an attribute, you should be able to split it because an attribute is a certain like okay, uh, uh, if it's an absolute thing. And we are not even absolute, we are corporeal, and even our mind has our limitation. So, in the true sense, in the reality, it is even possible to describe him, even if we have the, uh, 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 the, name, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe they are just there for us to try to understand what he is. The um, arm. Okay, for example, the um, the, uh, the Arabs, the Gnostics, or the uh, mystics, when they see revelation, they cannot even explain these things to people, okay? And that trust revelation, which is still technically corporeal. Yeah. So if we go to the absolute and not corporeal, how can we even attribute to that? I don't understand when we say scholars have different opinions. 
without different opinion whether you can attribute to them or they are uh, even even to the point that some say yes you can attribute to the absolute in the and that's it, that they differ. Uh, yeah, so it's an excellent <coughs> point. Sorry? It's an excellent point. Uh, I was actually thinking of presenting it in the next lesson, so I'm going to touch on it now and we'll explain it a little bit more in the next lesson. The essence of the attributes, we cannot get to them. Very cannot simple. get to them? No, we cannot understand them because they're absolute. Right. And we can never get to an absolute. We can never comprehend. Right. Because comprehend basically means you can contain it in your mind. You can't contain it in your mind. So is it only there for us to understand? Well, it's enough so that we understand enough of it. Is it absolutely disassociated from what we know? No. And this is our difference from the other schools. <coughs> this is the part that our Imams have taught us. And this is, inshallah, the part that I'll explain just a little bit more. And it doesn't really need that much explanation. It's one of those general principles that once you really understand it, then it opens a lot of doors for you. You start understanding the scriptures a lot more, whether it's the whole Quran or the narrations. Basically, the Imams don't want us to fall into two problems, two mistakes, that if you see the way in which people have described God and His attributes, they make one of these two mistakes and sometimes both. The first one, very common, we all know it, it's tashbih. So they basically say that Allah is similar to something else. Okay? It's similarity, tashbih. The biggest one, most known one, is anthropomorphism. So basically you give human attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether material or non-material. Okay? That's a whole huge topic. But that's one big mistake. And that can be <coughs> summed up with the notion of tanzih and notion of had, not to attribute had or limitations to God, hudud, hadda or haddiyya. The other problem, the other big mistake that pop people fall into, and this one is less common, but that's your point, the other uh, one, and we refer to it as well, is a ta'qil. So what is a ta'qil? A ta'qil is basically putting your mind on hold, being in a state of paralysis. So, and we have scholars in the Shia school, and we have scholars of, from other schools and from other religions who fall into this. So you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alim. What does Alim say? You say Alim means Alim. But what does, real, what does it really say? Does he have knowledge like us? No. Okay, what kind of knowledge does he have? Can, is it even attributable to our knowledge in one way, shape, or form? We don't know. All we know is he's Alim. So we repeat the word devotionally. We are told he's alim, so we believe he's alim. That's ta'qil. So basically, there is something, let's say in the Holy Quran, and the narrations, it says something, you say, what does it really mean? We don't know, don't ask questions. It's haram, you're not allowed to ask. And even if you tried, logically, you could never reach an answer. So you just stop there and you do ta'qil. No. So what I'm saying... And we have scholars who will not say it this way. I'll tell you what they say in a second. They don't say it this way. I'm saying if you really understand the narrations and you're aware of the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, you see that they taught their followers not to fall into these two mistakes. These two are mistakes. One of them is tashbih. So you say Allah is similar to. No, Allah is not similar to anything. There's no similarity. So for us it's just tanzih. Okay, and the second one is ta'qil. Ta'qil is, you say, I don't know. I have no clue what it means. No, no, you do have. You have a clue what it means. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran says that he's hay, he has life, you understand what life is. So how do we understand? How can he have life and I have life and he is, a, he is God? He's an absolute supreme being and I'm little me. How can it apply? How can I have knowledge and God can have knowledge? How can I have power? How can I have will and God has will? Okay, so here's to link it to the rational aspect of attributing attributes to God. The key is that the Imams have said, and this is related to another topic, which is the thingness. Is Allah a thing or not a thing? Okay, and inshallah we'll talk a little bit more about that. But they say Allah is a thing. And by saying he's a thing, you don't fall into the two mistakes of tashbih and ta'qil. Why? Because he is a thing not like any other thing. Okay, so there's no tashbih. 
But he is a thing. And your mind can understand what a thing is. Okay, so there's no ta'afiyyah. Shay. 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 Hal Allah Shay. They ask the Imam, can I say Allah is a thing? Can I say Allah Shay? He tells them, yes. Say Allah is a shay so that you don't fall into had a tashbih wa had a ta'ati. Okay, so now we have to say, okay, then they're saying it's okay to say that he has attribute, and they're telling us, be confident enough to say, you know what the attribute means. But then we have to go back to the negative, the lesson where we said there's negative attributes. The attribute must be abstracted, must be cleaned up of any limitations, of any lacks, of any imperfections, of any conditions, so that the attribute becomes in a raw state of perfection, and then you can attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so that means to figure out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he only can say, he not this, he not this, he not this, he not this, but that in reality means you cannot attribute what he is. Because you That's one way to understand it. Yes, yeah. you could. Yeah. Um, what well, after he said, but Plotinus, he says you can only know God through his negative attributes. Yes. He, <laughs> he refuses, yeah. other than calling him the one. Yeah. <coughs> everything else he says, the only way we know God is through what he is not. Yes. And it's the one. We're it's not God. The one, as yeah. he calls him. Yeah. And it's interesting. This discussion was had. Like 600 years before Rasulullah existed, yeah. and before that, like, during the time of Nabi Isa, yeah. within a century or so. Yeah. And it's interesting how these, uh, these discussions continued with Ahlul Bayt, and here we are now Ark, or discussing it. But say, say, my question is I had a question now. When we were discussing God's essential attribute of power, and it's something that we always hear. And uh, I don't completely understand what it's meant by it, and it's always the hadith is known by everyone. Ahlul Bayt say we are the middle path between the Mu'tazila, free will, and between the Asherite, uh, called the predestination. We're the middle path. I don't understand what that middle path is between the two. Asherite is predestination, so everything is okay, but the way they understand it, like, from what I know, the way to understand predestination is everything is destined for them. Uh, they have ownership of their intent, but they don't have ownership of the act. Mu'tazira, they believe in free will completely. But what do they mean? So how do the Shias differ from the Mu'tazira? Well, okay, we believe in free will. They believe. What is the difference between the two? And the, like, When they say they believe in it entirely, free will, does that mean they believe they can make their own Sharia? Does that believe... They don't believe they can choose their parents. They don't believe they can choose their height. What does their version of free will mean? And how does it differ from our understanding of free will? Yeah. So you just to let you know, we, we have uh, six minutes to be seven because I know that okay. you're Okay, yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so this topic requires a lengthy discussion. Yeah, because it was related to God's power. Well, so when they say we create our power, we create our actions, I should say no. God creates our action, which refers back to the predestination. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand when we say we're the middle path between the two, what does it really mean? Like, I don't understand how we differ from yeah, the okay. It's about do we have free will or not? Mm -hmm. And don't look at it as very philosophically as the, you know, how we live our lives and every aspect of it. Do you have blue eyes or green eyes or black eyes? Mm -hmm. It's not that. Everybody is talking about the one topic that really matters is, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to reward me as he said he would? And what happens when I go to the afterlife? Am I responsible for everything I did? And will Allah give me what he said? This is a reward, you get a reward. And this is uh, a sin, so if there's a punishment, you get a punishment. Right. The Asha'ara say, no. We cannot even say that. Mm -hmm. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has absolute freedom and he can, he can get to choose he whatever he wants. So we may go to Yom Al-Qiyamah. We hope that this is not what happens. But we may go to Yom Al-Qiyamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes all the prophets and throws them in hell. It's possible. And he takes all the kuffar and throws them to heaven. Yeah. Okay, that's what the Sha'ara say. And what does it say? Absolutely not. It's like, it's not even something that is possible. Right. Okay, but this is where one way to see it is, the Mu'tazila say because our reason refuses that. Yeah. 
And the Shia will say, you know, <laughs> get, go get lost here and your reason. Yeah. What does your reason have anything to do with anything? God, this is the absolute Jesus. power of God. Yeah, La yeah, Allah, Allah is not asked about what he does. Yeah. The Quran says, La yusalu amma yaf'al. You can't impose your reason on God's actions. Or your realm of justice. Right? So what's the answer to this? Can he do? Of course he can do. Okay. Well, he can. Okay. Do. Will he do? Okay, so maybe everybody agrees on he will not do or we hope he will not do, but why? The, uh, the, the key is in the why. And the why is because he has said he wouldn't. Ba'adil. He has imposed on himself. The key is what he has said is not worthy of him that he would not do. For a being like God, it would be unworthy to break his promise. And when he says, لا يظلم ربك أحدا, That's it. He'll be contradicting himself. himself. And he wouldn't. And he'd prescribe on himself yeah. mercy is the verse. <laughs> well, and, yeah, and you yeah. can add those. Like there's a whole internal uh, philosophy behind why would anyone break their word? Why would anyone mm -hmm. commit injustice? Because of lack of knowledge or lack of power or lack of wisdom. That's all broken down. But... Really, it comes down to something like this. The Mu'tazila want to impose reason on the actions of God. Mm. So they're both trying to avoid something. Mu'tazila say there is a system in place and Allah does not do abath. Mm -hmm. He does not play around. It's not randomness. Mm -hmm. That's what the Mu'tazila want to do in reaction to the Asha'ara who say it's absolute will, absolute power, power absolute knowledge, and you're just a puppet. And everything is pure tawheed. Everything that happens is Allah moving it directly or indirectly. Who are you to say you have will or power or knowledge? And this requires a lengthy discussion. Yes. So, so who's for, right and who's wrong? Both are right and both are wrong. Jesus. So, so for <laughs> us... They're right and they're in different things and they're wrong in different because things. Because we are... In and this is the, diff the, the middle part. Yeah. But it requires a lengthy <laughs> discussion. Well, yeah, but, exactly. but then again, it goes back to what's saying what Asherites say. Which is? The, from the, I understand because Asherites say he could do it or he could not do it. Yeah. We're saying, yeah, he could do it, but he would not do it. Yeah. But not for the same reasons. What's there? Okay, how not? Why not? We say Allah imposes on himself. You they say, say Allah imposes nothing. There is nothing imposed. It's a free for all. But, but there's clear verses in the Quran that he imposes. Al Ashara have verses and the Mu'tazil have verses. And books this thing okay, have been in action. Written. As to who creates this action, me yeah. moving my hand. Yes. God. Makes through his power, he moves my hand. If you're an Asher, yeah. Mu'tazila say no. God has given. There's me two types power. of action. This is a huge topic. There's mm -hmm. two types of action. There's an action or a will of God that falls in tashriq, another one that falls in taqwin. Mm -hmm. So there's one he gives you an existential power to do something, yeah. though he may not want you to do it. Yeah, like but he has different kinds power. of wants. If God existentially doesn't want you to do it, it's impossible to do it. Okay. If God legislatively doesn't want you to do it, I but can he, do it. you can still do it. They confuse all of us. We come and we break it down based on what our imams have taught us. We break it down and we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one order, one dimension. We can't say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> wanted people to kill Imam Hussein. No. no. But they still did. Yeah. So what? It's free? How does it work? Yeah. So this is where we have to say there's a legislative which we can order, go against and there is a existential one which we can which he might impose on me for whatever reason they contradict the two mm. so um, one yes. will say <laughs> Sayyid just uh, know, so yes, it yes. will not be short and, and confuse others more yes so maybe another day we can uh, have uh, the topic this topic, of this yeah. topic is going to be extensively dealt with in two or three lectures regarding the oh, okay. divine justice. So as soon as we're done with the yeah, attributes exactly. of, okay. and oneness yeah. of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we get into divine justice, which is an extension of these attributes, and then we'll delve okay. in depth into free will, predestination, and all the time. Yeah. Okay, so God knows if you're going to hell or heaven, right? Yeah. Okay, doesn't that mean it's predestination then? It depends how you understand it. But generally speaking, knowledge has nothing to do with if I can predict what you're going to do based on my knowledge, it doesn't mean that my knowledge forces you to do it. Okay. If I can read the future, if I can see the future, and I can see what you're doing, is my knowledge forcing you to do it? No. If I put an ice cube in my hand and the ice cube melts, it's a bad example, but I know that it's going to melt. I know all the conditions that would lead to its melting, and it melts. Is my knowledge of its melting causing it to melt? Then why, why create a creation that... 
that yeah, ends up sitting going to hell then if that's the case like then you have to come to the divine justice <laughs> the sense and we'll again the so the question is is he creating it to go to hell or does it fall into i give you the choice and if you decide to choose that you choose that it's a headache yeah that's why the, we don't i'll give you this. one quick example and then we'll talk about the topic all right at the beginning of Islam, there was a verse revealed. Exactly, yes. <coughs> All that man had to do was to become a Muslim. And he would have contradicted the entire Quran and the prophethood of the Prophet. Right. Everything would have crumbled. No wars, no nothing. He just refuted the Quran. Why didn't he become a Muslim? He's a retard. No, but I mean... So that's to me that that's a good way of encaps good answer, en encapsulating encapsulating the debate. It doesn't. If I know that you're gonna do or not do, this is not imposing on you that you're gonna do or not. Just prove me wrong. You could have proved the call. Of course. Yes. Okay. Hassan Sayyid. Wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa